You're listening to Mapping Minds. Hello, everyone. My name is Jimmy Sudicom, and this is the very first episode of Mapping Minds. Throughout the course of the show, we'll be talking to philosophers, scientists, and all sorts of other thinkers about the core insights of their work. I'm no expert on any of these topics, but I'm using this podcast as a chance to learn more and to share what I learned with all of you. With that goal in mind, I don't think there was a better person to talk to than David Pizarro. He is a professor at Cornell University and a researcher in moral psychology and emotion. He's also the co-host of the Very Bad Wizards podcast, which helped inspire this show. In this conversation, we talk about his work in more detail, his religious background, his uh, relationship with death and psychedelics, and many other topics I don't think he's touched on anywhere else. So please enjoy this conversation with David Pizarro. One thing I think is fascinating about podcasts is you start to feel like you're really in the conversation and that you really know these people. And yeah. there are tons of times when I'm listening to very bad wizards where I want to just like jump in and like scream something up with you guys. <laughs> That's great. That's great. You know, I think I've said this in, on other podcasts before, but I think there, there, there is a bit of an illusion going on because I feel the exact same way about podcasts, but where, because I'm listening usually like on my phone with earbuds it mimics so much the conversations that I would be having, like the 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 medium of conversation that I would be having, like talking to somebody with on my phone with an earbud in, that it's just kind of like a one way conversation. It feels very intimate, so so mm-hmm. I really enjoy it for that reason too. Yeah, and there's this whole social dimension too of like um, discussing the ideas where you know, like uh, like with, with with my friends, like talking about something that happened on your podcast or other podcasts yeah. that's happening that you're not even aware of as a podcaster, you know? That's true. That's true. And, and, uh, but that, those are some of the nicest emails to get when, um, we hear that people were talking about something like that. It stimulated some sort of conversation, um, between those people and, and you know, usually an argument or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, it feels really nice. I want to hear a little bit about how you came to, research psychology, specifically moral psychology. What was your trajectory to that? Why were you interested in that topic? You know, I was early on um, in maybe late high school, but definitely early college, I really started taking a liking to, I, you know, I think one of the first things I must have read was a Plato dialogue where they discussed justice. And thinking, wow, that's really cool. Like that you could just think about this stuff. Like I was always fascinated with right and wrong and good and evil and that stuff, but probably because I was raised very religious. Um, but when I realized that you could think about that stuff um, in a more systematic, analytic fashion and actually, you know, like there's this satisfying aspect to to thinking about argumentation and about ideas that comes from philosophy. And that's what drew me in. And then when I went to college, our college just didn't have a good philosophy program. Um, But I realized that there was this whole other side, this empirical side that you could actually think about some of these questions um, as a scientist and, and do studies on questions that had to do with morality. And that's what I think attracted me the most to psychology. But I will say this. I didn't know this at the time. This is all retrospect. You know, we can all tell stories about how and why we came to what we were doing. I was a business major my first year. I thought that what I wanted to do was like go into marketing and advertising. And in retrospect, I don't know what, what I was thinking. It wasn't until I started taking psych classes that I realized like, oh my God, I how could I possibly ever? And I started taking accounting classes and I thought to myself, well, what am I doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> was there a particular course or um, like topic that sort of converted you to the idea? You know, there was one course and I here's where I actually got lucky. So I went to a small liberal arts college, it was a, a religious college. 
but we had a very good psych department. And when I was, I believe, I don't remember if I was a freshman or a sophomore, I just had the, not the balls, it was misguided. I had the, the uh, idea that I could ask to be in an upper division seminar and I could just, you know, like a 400 level where it's like small classes and you have discussion. I had only taken one psych class before and I just went to a professor and I said, hey, can I take this? Um, it's a, a, a class called History and Systems of Psychology that was intended for only like fourth year majors. And the guy took a liking to me, I guess. And I took that class. And that was, I don't know that I would have gone into psychology had I not taken that class first because it was, and I suspect, Jimmy, it's something that you would enjoy too, because it was the kind of class that gave a broad intellectual overview of Western thinking, really, mm. from the earliest philosophers all the way to modern cognitive science. And it was intended to give psychology majors sort of like a that final overview of the field. But it was just so fascinating to have discussions about, you know, whatever, dualism and and behaviorism all in one class with only a few professors. That in, that joy that you have when you first discover some of these intellectual worlds, at least that some people have, that's what I experienced and that got me hooked. Yeah. yeah wow you like kind of jumped to like the best stuff like, <laughs> yeah that it, everything was down honestly everything was downhill from there i think that if i had started with like social psych or whatever which is what i do now i don't know that i would <laughs> have enjoyed it and it's not a strategy that everybody should adopt because if everybody adopted what i did it wouldn't work but if you really love something if you took like an intro class and you really think you love it you know take just go ask if you can take some more advanced classes. I don't know if you had that experience with, you know, part of it is finding something that you're okay at. I think that's mm. what part of my experience was, was it was finally something that I realized I could do a pretty good job at. And I, and getting that reinforcement from the professor was a huge, huge part of me deciding to go into that career. But if you, you, we were just chatting beforehand, you were telling me you had a music background, but I imagine that the first time, somebody said, hey, you, you could actually pursue this, that that's a rewarding feeling. And so being able to move to a more advanced level earlier than anticipated is just deeply rewarding. Oh, I think about that all the time, like how how much of one's personality just comes from a compliment you got when you were like eight years yeah, old. It's you incredible, know? right? Yeah, yeah. I always actually, that that's, it's, I, I think that's an insightful it sounds trite, but it's actually deeply true. And I realize, you know, I, I often think about how I used to be fairly introverted until I realized that I could get attention from my <laughs> fellow classmates for talking shit, you know. And I was so well behaved until I got rewarded for acting out. <laughs> and then <laughs> the next like three or four years I spent in the principal's office. <laughs> yeah. So. It seems like most of your work, at least the highly publicized stuff, is around disgust and how it impacts our other political views, ways of seeing the world. Um, could you talk a little bit more about just like a general overview of what you've thought about a lot professionally? Yeah, definitely. So one of the um, we've we talked a little bit about my interest in morality and ethics and I went into graduate school with an interest in studying the psychology behind morality. It just so happens that that wasn't being studied that much. Um, it was as, as you know, just, just like anything else, there are fashions and trends in, in science and moral development wasn't really that hot. Um, so I thought I had to set it aside. I thought I was just going to have to pay my dues, study some traditional thing in psychology. And, and then if I was lucky enough to get a job at a, as a professor, then I could start studying whatever I wanted. But um, fairly late in my graduate career, I realized that there were professors who were super supportive and they, were, they would let me study whatever I wanted. One of those was Paul Bloom. And he actually taught a course on... I believe the whole thing was about disgust. It could have been just it could have been just a couple of weeks that he spent on disgust, and that's what originally got me interested in in the topic because I was also interested in emotion, sort of as a side as a side uh, interest. And disgust 
is this interesting emotion that is strong. It's very easy to elicit in somebody, and some people more than others. And it seemed to play a fairly big role, or at least an oversized role, I thought, in the way that people talked about things that were right and wrong. Especially now, you know, these are this is the late 90s now, but but you know, we had been through culture wars in the United States already about homosexuality and things. Um like anything that was perceived as deviant sexuality at that time. And the the language of disgust was very strong. And I took an interest in, um, in this stuff from the angle of individual differences. So we all, um, for most emotions, we have just different kind of set levels, right? So some people are more anxious than others. Some people are, are happier than others. Some people are, are more easily disgusted than others. And building on the work of some other folks, we were interested in figuring out whether or not being more easily disgusted, being the sort of person who gets easily grossed out, would make you more likely to adopt certain views. That is, so if imagine that I'm trying to convince you that homosexuality is wrong, and I say, like, think about how gross it is. Now, as a heterosexual man, I don't know if you are, but (laughs) but just for the sake of the argument, um, you might think that sex that is not the kind of sex that you want is gross. So if you are especially prone to being easily grossed out, maybe those arguments work well on you. Maybe that's the way that I can get you to believe that some things are wrong, whether it's homosexuality, in some cases, maybe it's uh, attitudes toward um, women's rights. We saw, we've seen a bunch of propaganda in wartime where people use disgust as a way to dehumanize um, Mm. outsiders. Maybe these individual differences could predict who is going to be more likely to, to believe those things or to, to be persuaded by those kind of arguments. So that's where we started. Long story short over the last 10 years, what we found was this thing that we didn't try to find. In fact, I ignored it for a while. And that was that disgust, the, Degree to which you are easily disgusted predicts your political orientation, your basic right-left political orientation. And now we've found this in multiple samples, multiple studies, our lab, other labs, and across the world. It seems to be that people who are more easily grossed out are more likely to say that they're politically conservative. And so a lot of the last 10 years of our research has been trying to unpack why that is. And I should say here, what another way of saying this is that people who are liberal are less easily disgusted because it's very easy to frame it in terms of, and I get a little bit annoyed, even though I'm liberal, I get annoyed at my field for trying to make the conservative part, the thing that needs to be explained. Like there's no, there's no right amount of disgust to have. It just so happens that we found this pattern, less easily disgusted, more liberal, more easily disgusted, more conservative. And trying to explain why that is, has taken up a lot of our time. Hmm. Yeah, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that uh, even Jordan Peterson has given a shout out to uh, you guys' research. <laughs> so Maybe. so your, you guys' work has uh, uh, lived at the periphery of the dialogue the last few years. Well, thank you. That makes me feel uh, happy, of course. And I this is at a point where I do say that, you know, um, some of this work was originally done with Paul Bloom. Um, we then ended up collaborating with Jonathan Haidt. Um, and this, most of the work was done with my former grad student, Yoel Imbar, and there have just been a lot of very, very interesting and good collaborators we've had on this that have made, um, that have made it exciting, you know, because I think that the, the social aspect of, of doing this, of doing science in general, or maybe it just any career, um, but I think science in particular, you often think that you're devoting yourself wholly to obsessing over a specific question. But what people don't talk about a lot is how important it is to build friendships and relationships and collaborations with people. Um, And that's just counter stereotypical to what we think of as a scientist, but I think it predicts a lot of success in science, the degree to which you can build bridges with the research of other people and, and, um, and work with them or with their ideas. And that certainly has been the case uh, for us. And so for when you say Jordan Peterson, I think immediately, well, yeah, John Haidt has been very gracious to us about our research. And I'm sure that that it's just out in the public uh, 
intellectual public sphere because people like Paul Bloom and John Hyde have written about it very kindly. Yeah. Well, and you guys yeah. have become kind of like a, a scene, like anyone who listens to your podcast, like Yoel, Paul Bloom, like all those yeah, guys. Yeah, it's a little, like, a little crew. We need more stars. women in our crew, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> how, uh, how has your work impacted your own ethics at all? Have you felt like you've like had to change how you think about the world yeah that's a good question and it's hard to introspect it's hard to introspect for causality so here here's what i mean um i definitely think there's a relationship between the work that i've done and the way that i've thought about just my ideas about social and political issues um i like to think that at the very least one of the things, one of the directions that there has been influence is being forced to think critically about why we believe the things that we believe, whether it's political or social or moral, has made me uh, more careful about what I believe and hmm. at least made me desire being a, um, on firmer ground. I was raised in a very religious environment where um, it wasn't uncommon to to have a lot of people expressing hateful views towards a homosexuality and what religion were you i was raised as seventh day adventist which is it's a protestant christian it's denomination um but it's just has you know it's a little weirder it's a little uh, one of the younger uh religions it's mm -hmm. what ben carson was for anybody who followed american politics um and it just has some now luckily my parents were not like this uh but plenty of people in my family were you know a little bit misogynistic a little bit um homophobic and i definitely was following in their footsteps in high school now i don't know if it was a desire to be a bit more questioning of ethics that led me to study what i study or whether it was studying what i studied that led me to be more questioning of my ethics but the two are definitely related at least they feel so to me mm. so you were the the dialogue around homosexuality and all these things that you were immersed in through your religious background led you to ask a lot to be skeptical of you know the moral download that you got from your culture yeah so then you you were already skeptical to begin with i you know i i think so i think i had you know a um a mind that liked that kind of inquiry and um to be honest at a time in a place had i been raised differently maybe i just would have be, you know been um a religious thinker i was i was a double major in religion um or one sorry one class shy of a double major in religion <laughs> and i could have seen myself just being you know if certain people like intellectual play and like i would have i could have been somebody who was a religious thinker instead of somebody who went into the social sciences or in philosophy i think that it it the inquisitive mind combined with the influences um, in philosophy and psychology probably led me to question more um, than I would have otherwise, which I take as a good thing. But another thing that I actually think uh, my background gave me was at least a respect and understanding for differing viewpoints, because I don't want it to sound as if there's hateful people and then there's me, right? That's that's not at all how I my experience of being raised. Like these were, there are a lot of people who genuinely disagree because they honestly believe that they are they're right about something. And um, that's what makes it hard. If there were just good guys and bad guys, and there were people who who uh, were hateful, you know, like like in Star Wars, it's always ridiculous to me that that the Emperor in Star Wars would say like embrace hatred. Like who says that? There aren't yeah. people like that in the real world. I mean, occasionally I suppose, but people aren't villains in the way that that we make them out to be in movies. And people genuinely disagree about issues that sometimes can even be as important as issues about human rights but they they honestly come to the table thinking that they are doing the right thing and and i think that having that diversity of of background being raised that way has given me a little more patience and understanding that 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 good people can disagree about things yeah well that's uh that's one of the insights that 
Sam Harris has in talking about actually listening to uh, people yeah. and their stated beliefs. Um, right. I I grew up devout Mormon, so oh, yeah. I, so there you go, Adventist Mormon. Where yeah, we, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's just you know I remember what it was like to believe with my whole being that this was true, and I, it's not that hard for me to imagine in that state. Um, if I was told to strap a bomb on myself and to die for this belief, like, yeah, that's it, it, it's not that hard to have an insight into the fundamentalist mind, you know. It's that's interesting that you say that because there is so um, the one the one thing about my religion was that there was a lot of encouraging to read the Bible. So so if you're a nerd and you were raised in that religion, chances are you nerd out about the Bible at some point, which I did, and I remember reading. Um, there's a, in, in the New Testament book of Hebrews, there's a, a, a section where the author talks about the power of faith by faith. You could do this by faith. You could do that by faith. Abraham did this and, and Isaac did that. And I remember at some point in the dis, the real discomfort of having to abandon what the beliefs that I was raised with, um, you know, it's a, I don't know if you went through this, but it was not. It was not fun to start questioning your beliefs. I realized that that faith. I don't how did how to say this well. Like that faith, because of the low standard of evidence, you could come to believe a lot of very very crazy things, while the whole time believing that all you're doing is letting go. Like like you know. Don't don't question too much. Just believe. That seems like a real dangerous way to raise somebody or to train them to think. Like by not questioning, by just accept through faith. Because that does seem how we get to suicide bombs. That does seem how we get to hatred sometimes. Well, uh, the LDS Church has a, a, a different technique that's uh, really interesting where they say don't take our word for it you can just pray and uh ask god yourself it's james 1 5 and you laugh with yeah. him, let him ask of god who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not you know yeah uh and so then you're you're listening you know you're you're sitting there and like looking for some internal feedback of like a confirmation of truth yeah um, yeah. Yeah. no totally and and the thing is and i remember this was something um that I really realized and appreciated when I took a sociology of religion course, there is no such thing as religion absent social context. There is no such thing as coming to coming to God with no preconceived notions of what he's going to tell you. Um, Mm. It is fundamentally when that happens to you, you are fundamentally going to rely on the ideas and the culture that you were raised in. And so you're going to arrive when they say, just have an open mind and come to God. It's not like they're going to accept it. If you say, you know what? I did it. And I realized that, uh, Vishnu is actually the God I should be worshiping. They're going to say, well, you didn't do it right, buddy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, you, you pray and ask God and only these options are correct. And then, uh, if you get a different answer, then like, are you sinning in your spare time? Like what's, what's clouding your judgment that you're not getting the right answer? So, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. (laughs) There's not a lot of hopping around religions because people are genuinely trying, you know, there's, it's not a it's not a mystery that people when when they go back to god they go back to the god that they were raised with it's very rare to go somewhere else yeah i mean when i left the church it was extremely traumatic i was uh on my mission uh every um mormon male at the age of 19 goes on a two-year mission do you have to do that by the way or like will you get kicked out if you don't do that or is it just like a real real strongly encouraged it's like a, a, a socially reinforcing, like you're mm-hmm. not, you, you're not required to go, but it's like, you know, your whole life. It's like, yeah. this is your coming of age experience, right. you know, yeah. um, deployment into, uh, the field. Yeah. But as such, you know, I was, I, I just delved in, and I studied as in, intensely as possible because I really 
believed in it. And I sort of aged, you know, it was kind of like I graduated from Mormonism, it felt like, because I saw how it was constructed. Um, you go through the temple ceremony and it's, um, has some really strong influences for uh, Freemasonry. Yeah. And so if you've been at all exposed to symbols and, um, or these different, uh, religious models, you can look at the evidence of Joseph Smith becoming a master Mason, like three months prior to revealing oh, this, wow. um, this, uh, ceremony, you know, that even, even if you're really, really devout, there's a, there's a point at which the illusion can't hold anymore and you yeah. have to look at it and then it just sort of falls apart, you know? And that's when you can rely on just faith. Yeah. Um, well, to, to keep, or not, <laughs> or not. So did yeah. you lose a lot of family, familial relationships because of this? I'm my family's really cool. I mean, we're from yeah. Tennessee and it's kind of a different, uh, culture than the, you know, like the Utah I, Mormons. Yeah. Because it's something about when you're like in the majority, yep. you, it changes how free you feel in, uh, persecuting minorities, you know? Right. Um, but when you grow up in an area where you're like, uh, and I, I went to a church of Christ private school until I was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in high school. And, uh, when you're the person who's going to hell in a group of mm -hmm. a bunch of people who believe differently, it changes actually how you think about these ideas. Cause you start yeah. to become more sensitive to different belief systems, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah. There is something that is, um, there are a lot of kids. I actually went to an Adventist college. Um, there are a lot of my dear friends who never left the seventh Adventist world. Like they never just, they went to elementary, junior high academy, college, medical school or dental school, and now work in, you know, say Loma Linda, uh, California, which is, is where, where there's a big medical school. And it's like they've never been tested by having to live their beliefs in a in in a world where they're a minority it's so mm. it's weird they never they never really it's so obvious to them that these things are true mm. um and that anybody who questions it is doing a bad thing um mm. it's it's weird it's odd yeah have you kept on to have you held on to any of your seventh day upbringing at all like do you eat pork and do you like you know, chill out <laughs> more on Saturdays? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I was raised vegetarian, um, and it's not it's not a, a mandate by the church. It's just a, we happen to have a lot of uh, vegetarians in the religion, but they don't eat pork. So I, I it's easy for me not to eat pork because I don't eat meat at all. Mm. Um, for a long time, I held on to the Saturday. So Seventh Day Adventists keep the Sabbath, not as strictly say an Orthodox Jew, but but um, sun sundown uh, to sundown, Friday to Saturday, and I held on to that for a long time to not doing any work, and mm. that that sort of eroded as my life got more complicated and and my career got busier. I miss it. In fact, I I think it is one of the best ideas anybody has ever had, which is to take one day off and not just choose every time to every week to not do work on saturday but give up the idea that that's a work day i i found that it's so it's so good mentally to recharge that way and i i don't do it anymore because it because it, it really is a choice every time okay should i or should i not do it this saturday right there's something yeah. nice about having just a rule nope no work right? oh yeah and I, I when i was first getting uh jobs in high school that was the, you know, the deal breaker thing. I had to be like, like, I can't work on Sundays. You know, yeah. that's, that's a yeah. strict rule I have, you know? Right. Oh, so, so LDS are stricter Sabbath keepers, but on, on Sunday. Yeah. There are some things that are kind of more um, like family rules, like whether you watch TV or what type of content you, right. yeah. you can watch, you know? But yeah, I mean, I, I was very strict about it. Like, uh, I, I wouldn't spend any money on Sundays or, uh, even like hang out with friends. Like it was mostly yeah. just like solitude, you know? Yeah. So, yep. 
Yeah, no, I, I do miss it. So, so I haven't held on to much. I do when I go back to California and hang out with my family. I just don't talk to them about religion very much, and I'll even occasionally go to church because I, one thing that I can't stand too much of is, you know, when you think about what your family, if they're true believers, what they're thinking is that you're not going to go to heaven, like that. That's not an easy thought for a true believer to have about their family member. So I, it's better to me for me to just not talk about it too much um, f- with people like my parents. With my friends, I don't give a fuck, right? Like, you know, I can argue mm. with them about stuff. But with my parents, it's just, it, it would make me sad if they thought that I was completely off of the path. So do they have any inkling of what your actual belief they, system is the last few conversations we ever had about religion were <laughs> contentious enough that if they believe that i believe still that's motivated reasoning on their part so i just <laughs> i just don't bring it up <laughs> i just do not bring it up <laughs> so when i lost my religion i then was set with uh the daunting task of actually accepting that death is real yeah um yeah because you because that's something that p- people don't really talk about much that uh the loss of belief is like not just losing a, a, a cultural framework a um a way of seeing the world but it's like you just got downgraded from immortality to you maybe have like 40 50 years left if you're totally. lucky you know oh it's it that shit still keeps me up at night uh, if anybody <laughs> listens to uh, the podcast i do with tamler the fear of death is a common theme and it it is not comfortable although i got to say the thought of living forever was pretty aversive to me too like <laughs> i don't like the idea of forever in in either scenario <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and so that's that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about. Um, for one of the really healing parts of um, my early 20s was discovering psychedelics yeah. and having in, endogenous religious experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm wondering, have you ever exper- ex- experimented with psychedelics no, at all? No, man. I have not. And, <clears throat> you know, I've talked to sam harris about it and tamler and plenty of friends who have had these wonderful experiences and i am a a bit of a wuss um i don't the thought of having a bad trip is so aversive to me because i've had um this is just from being stupid and in college and trying too much weed i had like a two hour long panic attack because i got so high that I never wanted to experience that again. <laughs> and the thought of, of like having a bad trip on acid and like ha- having to deal with that shit for like whatever, seven hours, I'm, I'm too, I'm afraid. Mm. I'm just, I'm just afraid. Yeah. Are you, are you, uh, <clears throat> do you follow at all much of the, um, like MDMA assisted psychotherapy research that's coming out or? only only very cursory so right so um there's uh you know by cursory i mean whatever comes across my twitter uh, yeah. twitter feed i mean mdma was originally used that way right for for psychotherapy but yeah. then there's this other work on on depression and um what's the name of the drug the g drug g the things re- researched mostly are uh ketamine uh, MDMA. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, and I was thinking GHB, ketamine. Yeah, yeah, ketamine, yeah. GHB, GHB. <laughs> that's uh, just treated. <laughs> that's just too fun. No, just... <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, so ketamine assisted therapy for uh, depression, depression and yeah. usually trauma for uh, with MDMA, and then there's psilocybin research as well, usually for depression. So. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I I should say I tried a little bit of of uh, mushroom tea once, and I I do remember feeling quite euphoric it was small enough dose that i didn't have any trip like yeah yeah uh i i think that uh, your your bad cannabis trip like <laughs> people are so flippant with their uh their talk around uh smoking weed that yeah. it's like uh it, but it really is a uh, an intense psychedelic drug or can be Dude, you know, I was my college was in in Northern California, and this was like the late '90s. I, I don't know what was around, but certainly wasn't 
you know, <laughs> regulated. And I remember exactly what I was, you know, I had, I had smoked a bit because everybody up there smoked. And I tried, all I remember was like red and purple and crystally looking shit. And I remember <laughs> my friend, he, he brought me in. It was like the, the end of my junior year. And he was like, just to celebrate being done with classes, he, he brought me in to take, take some hits from the bong. And I remember him telling me to like slow down because uh, I didn't realize <laughs> how much I was smoking. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's like, man, Pease, you were sucking it like a dick. <laughs> and I was like, oh, why didn't you stop me? Because like literally, you know, like two, five minutes later, I was in my room going like, uh-oh, 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 <laughs> what's going on? Yeah. 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 Well, I, I will say that um, if I had to choose between doing a very light mushroom dose mm -hmm. on the regular and uh smoking weed on a daily basis like yeah it, it would be mushrooms yeah and sound because it's actually there's some chemicals you take like alcohol and weed that they they seem to to have no like like default experience that you're going to have it's just right. it's coloring whatever experience you're already having well um there's something that almost seems like inherently benevolent and hmm. like safe if that makes sense yeah. about uh, certain psychedelic experiences. And, and the reason why I would invite you to do that is because of your discomfort around the death topic. That's um, interesting. So, so you found that therapeutic to oh, in your dealing with death. Oh yeah. Tremendously. So because, and, and not in, in the sense of like, you know, discovering that we actually will no, right. continue after, um, after death and there'll be this transmigration of souls type thing. But more that you don't know how like wildly different consciousness can actually be until you are thrust into it like that. Yeah. And, um, and, and that sort of, sort of, uh, becoming more familiar with those states can, uh, at least for me, make you more comfortable with modulations in that state, hmm. you know? Yeah. All right. Right. So, yeah, it's, in, that's interesting. Maybe with a in a safe environment, I'll have to give it a try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I care about your uh, relationship with death and kind of like, I, I hope that you're able to get a healthier place with all that. Oh, that's so. kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, the way that most people get a uh, deal with death is just see it s slowly approaching. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um. There are tons of ideas in clinical psychology, at least, uh, of trauma stored in the body, memory stored in the body. Um, does that come into your research at all? Because it seems like our intuitions would be emerging from these bodily processes. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit, not like not so much the clinical aspect of it, but but there is something really interesting there in the study of emotions. And, and I think that, um, that at least the, the intellectual history of how people dealt with emotions has, uh, there's been, there's been a, a shift in how we understand these things. Um, because for, for a variety of reasons, but here's, here's one, um, real important guiding metaphor of cognitive science and psychology in the last, whatever, 50 years has been that of the computer, right? So that our minds are input-output systems. They are symbol manipulations. Like the, the best way to understand the human mind is to understand it as a base, basically a biological computer. This was very consistent with even older ideas on reason and rationality being what human nature was all about and a sort of setting emotions aside as things that were uh, lesser uh, things that were part of the animal kingdom. Um, and the, the dominant metaphor of the, of the human mind being a computer is uh, it essentially leaves very little room for emotional things and even for bodily things, right? It's like the central processing unit is just the neurons in your brain. And I think that that led to an impediment in the way that we understand and study emotion and bodily states. And I think that one of the things that we had to get past as a field was that thought that it's not that anybody 
thought that emotions didn't exist or they didn't influence judgment, but it was treated as a, okay, here is you, Jamie, your mind. And sometimes there is other shit that influences it, like an emotion. It's sort of like a, an annoyance, uh, something that is making your mind work differently than it ought to work. It's not that emotions um, were held as in any way as important or as equal equivalent to cognitions, but rather they were just a nuisance variable to be to be dealt with when trying to understand the human mind. So you have years and years of research on things like memory and perception, uh, even moral judgment that ignored the influence of emotion or to the extent that they dealt with it, they dealt with it as, as again, a nuisance variable. Um, and uh, there is a tradition that emerged out of all of that that, that people have referred to as an embodiment that uh, emotion researchers have really embraced. And that is to take seriously the idea that uh, the human mind is not just what's between our skull, but rather it is the complex interplay of all of our bodily systems. And the strongest view here in the embodiment camp, like the, the people who, who came up with this idea, uh, is that um, the concepts that we have would not exist if we were in different bodies. So they, they believe that there's something that is so fundamental to having the kinds of bodies that we have that it gave rise to to ideas um, that uh, that are that seem central and even purely cognitive. So um, a lot of this work has been on metaphors, right? So when something is high or low in in the abstract sense, we're making an appeal to our own physical experiences being high or low, um, forward mm. or behind, you know, f- to be forward looking. Um, our metaphors for time uh, are often just metaphors that that we take from location, physical location. Mm. So there is, I think, a really interesting strand of ideas that were developed starting probably late 80s, early 90s, and have worked their way into psychology that, that lead us to, uh, hopefully, away from thinking of, of just vat, brains in a vat kind of psychology, but to take seriously that our bodies are playing an important role. Yeah, yeah, that seems to be, there's this very uh, kind of analytical, computery way of thinking that uh, omits this whole, you you already have this software, well, I yeah. guess the hardware, and then the software to interface with it in your body that are t- telling you all these things all the time about the world. That's right. And you know, there is a, I think there there's good reasons for why people want this to be the case. And I think it it's, if you look at what uh, your iPhone does versus your desktop computer does, they both might run Microsoft Word, right? So you can you uh, you have Microsoft Word running on your iPhone, you have Microsoft Word running on on your PC. Um, those are very different physical systems. Those are uh, you know what uh, one of them is an Intel chip, another one is an ARM chip. Like doesn't matter, but like just they are different. They are different physical systems. But the same program is instantiated in at this abstract level, right? So it doesn't it doesn't matter that one of them is this kind of chip and the other one is this kind of chip. They both functionally are doing the same thing. So this functional level, um, this philosophical view called functionalism, it holds that you know we just happen to be computers that are meat based, um, but there is nothing that would stop a uh, silicone computer from having the same kinds of mental processes that we had. And in fact, if you had a really, really sophisticated silicone computer that, uh, that we programmed right, it would essentially be doing the same thing that a human being is doing. It could have the same kinds of thoughts and the same kind of conscious experience that human beings are doing. So it's a desire to believe that all of the interesting stuff is at this abstract layer of symbol manipulation. It doesn't matter if it's an ARM chip or an Intel chip or a Motorola chip or a brain with neurons or whatever other thing we haven't discovered yet. A machine that can do calculations ought to be capable of the same thing as a human mind. And I think that the desire to believe that, that sort of functionless account of what the mind is, led people to ignore 
the particular kind of bodies and brains that we have. And, um, and I, maybe it was misguided, but it was misguided because of a real belief that we, we want to make progress in understanding how the mind works. And, um, it would be good if minds could be minds independent of the particular medium in which we are seeing them. Like a Martian could have just green goo in their brain, but still be capable of thinking things. I don't know if that made sense, but I think that was a lot of the motivation for this computational metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. I, what comes to mind is Marshall McLuhan's medium is a message and the idea that there's something about the the way that the data is being processed that is yeah. going to impact. I mean, you can think of it in your own life or, or even like blindness or something. Their experience of reality is yeah. so dramatically different that it, it, it in, inevitably shapes how they think. And so there's no reason to think that the experience of being uh, an alien with completely different um, optic nerve and different uh, wavelengths of vision is going to, it would obviously impact how yeah. they see the world. Yep. And, and impact it deeply. So, so uh, what, what a hardcore functionalist would want to say is a logic gate and a neuron might just be doing the same thing. Like whether you're operating on silicone logic gates or operating with neurons, if you think of a dog, you're thinking of a dog. And that concept of a dog is a universal. It's the same. Like you have the concept, you have the concept. It just happens to be on different hardware. Um, you made me think though of something even an even broader view that I think is is in some ways fundamentally right that that takes that goes not just from embodiment, not just from saying like our our minds are made up of not just our brains but our entire physical experience but also our in environmental surroundings. So the, the particular environment in which human beings live and, uh, and you know, think and talk is, for some people, could be considered part of the operations of our mind. So if you've offloaded something to your phone, that's just part of your, now it's part of your nervous system. You, you know, I don't remember phone numbers anymore because I just have to look them up. It used to be that phone numbers were stored in my wet wear in between my head. And now they're stored on my hip with my, right? So, so taking a broader view of how our biology interacts holistically with itself as well as the environment, I think can give us a better understanding of how our minds work just mm. yeah and this sort of relates to the the more i've delved into uh my like hobbyist study of philosophy it the more everything starts to look like aesthetics like <laughs> it, it just inevitably becomes it because uh questions of you know like how we think um what is consciousness ends up becoming something about like preference and what pleases us and the things that sort of resonate on some level you know and, and it's not the most scientific way of seeing the world but it, it kind of it, it it's always being structured in a narrative that has to 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 resonate on like this kind of bodily level does that make sense at all do you relate to that kind of when you when you dig into these questions it becomes something more um kind of impressionistic in a way yeah. So I think you're pointing to maybe maybe it's this. There's something um there is a uh, a notion of elegance in science that um that is that approaches aesthetics. Um mm. and when you see this I think the most when you're talking to um people who do like math for instance, right? Where they have a very strong at least it's clearest there where they have a very strong set of intuitions about what might be right or wrong and they have a an almost aesthetic experience when they see something elegant like an elegant mathematical proof they mm. have this like sort of satisfaction that it brings them it is it is <laughs> like like uh, an aesthetic experience of seeing a beautiful work of art at least for them um it's an interesting feature of our minds that we feel pleasure 
from that, that we feel a, a deep sense of pleasure both from, say, natural beauty or artistic beauty, and in some cases for a good scientific explanation. Right? There's a there yeah. is a, a psychologist who once wrote a piece called "Explanation as Orgasm." And what she was saying was that there is something about like when you find out how something works and you get the real explanation, it feels like there's a release. You're like, oh, like that feels great. And I think that that it's crazy that our brains, our minds are such that we can sit there and write out on a piece of paper, write out some equations, and that actually happens to be able to predict the motion of stars in the sky. Mm. that's crazy enough as it is that other people can see it and feel something when they know oh like that's incredible that's a theorem that you just demonstrated and and that you've proven and uh and that explains why the planet the stars appear to be moving the way they are but they're actually moving this way we get as a as a species we get this incredibly uh you know i don't i don't i don't know how it could have evolved i mean there's some stories about the evolution of this kind of thinking but it really is a very odd um any scientist who says that they don't have some sort of aesthetic feel about a theory that they hear about right that this this one sounds right this one doesn't this one's an elegant one this one's not i think they'd be lying or they'd be a bad scientist like there is something deeply emotional um in our in our thinking about theories and science thinking about math thinking about the world around us i don't know if that's Mm. where you were going with that but so yeah well i think where i'm going with that is um our intuitions about what like our bodily intuitions about what is true end up shaping questions that seem completely unrelated for example there's uh this inextricable link that it seems to like topics like class and how we structure class how we think about things associated with um you know poverty uh like a a lot of people who don't ride ride the train very much or don't take mass transit uh describe feeling disgusted by the smells and other things that are happening that are kind of not in the uh not in the normal experience so um but that's obviously um something that's emerging out of a cultural form so yeah yeah there's a there's a big question there um you know for whatever reason whether it's biological and evolutionarily endowed or whether it's environmental and uh, something we learn over time we definitely have a set of emotional reactions to the world around us And those shape and color our experience in important ways, so much so that it's hard to see outside of our own experience. It's very hard to tell somebody that they shouldn't be disgusted by something. It is so fundamental to to the experience, right? So I am a non-meat eater. I get completely grossed out at the thought of um, eating some kinds of meat, especially to tell me that I shouldn't feel that feels like you you're missing you're you're missing the point because I that's just what I feel that just yeah. is what I feel um but I do think that that there is a danger that our these instincts these intuitions and these emotions feel so real to us that they feel like truth and I think the danger is to treat them as true, to treat the world as if to, for me to say, for instance, no, um, meat really is disgusting. I am perceiving the truth of the world around me. Um, mm-hmm. Or no, riding a bus in LA really is disgusting, which is kind of <laughs> true. <laughs> um, and not appreciating that somebody else can have a completely different experience. Um, so, I am wary about, about, you know, championing these sources of truth without having the actual backing for them when, when, when we're talking about something as basic as an intuition or an emotional reaction. I want to be able to say 
that the true things I know are true because of more than just that. But it's certainly the starting place for a lot of things. Yeah. It has to be. There's no we I don't think we would have that's that's our connection to the world around us, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so that's that's cuz disgust does seem to be something that emerges out of an evolutionary process for sure, but our native intuitions can be hijacked by all these other um stimuli and there's no way to really there's no easy way to discern between what's like a true feeling and something that's you know not like a a possession of some other cultural idea yeah and it's tough because you know so disgust is obviously uh, you know there is um probably a clear evolutionary account for why we experience disgust in some cases um and it just is the case that it extends to a whole bunch of different things and could influence our our uh, perceptions and our beliefs. And it's hard to know uh, when, like, what do you use to determine when it's the right response and when it's the wrong response? You're kind of left with, you know, falling back on something reasonable and rational and and attempting to find independent grounds for believing that something is good or bad that doesn't just rely on that initial gut reaction whether that initial gut reaction is to be afraid or to be grossed out or even to be happy to be turned on right there are a lot of things that um that our bodies were built to respond to the world around us because it made sense evolutionarily and now we're left with for better or for worse a body in a modern environment that is constantly responding with these these kinds of emotional reactions or in some cases intuitions and can do damage. Figuring out when to downregulate those responses, when to ignore them and when not to is a task for modern humanity that no other animal has, right? Well, in many ways you've kind of uh you're you've really just continued your religious project into this uh <laughs> into this work cuz you're trying to get at like what is the right way to to think about the world yeah that's the goal at least right what do we have an independent f- foot to stand on to say to 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 be able to say these are the true things about the world these are the, these are the right things these are the way things are in and of themselves and it's a it's a task because in some ways, as I was saying before, in some ways it's misguided because the very tools that we have for understanding the world are the tools that we were endowed with due to our biological evolutionary history. Um, it's a weird thing that we uh, were able to count how many sheep we have or how many fingers and toes we have. And that that over centuries became mathematics. And now we have like a formal system of numbers that can tell us like how to build a bridge or how to shoot a rocket into space. It's incredible. So it's like, there's something there. We're just grasping at it. It's our, our minds and our bodies are tracking something that seems to be true independent of our minds and our bodies. But the only way we have to track it is to use our minds and our bodies. Mm. So in your years of doing very bad wizards, is there a topic or a work that you focused on that impacted you the most? <sighs> yeah, I, I think so. And a lot of it has to do with circling back to questions about life and meaning and death. Um, the times that we've discussed broadly, the questions of meaning in life have been the ones that have been not only most fun for me, but the, the ones that have, stayed with me so there's been uh, a a few times um that that we've had these kinds of conversations one was on a, an essay by the philosopher thomas nagel on on the absurdity of life it's just an essay on on the meaning of life two other ones have been from the bible from the book of ecclesiastes and the book of job and yeah. those have been i think not only the most fun for me perhaps for tamler as well but also perhaps at the top of the most meaningful list for our listeners because, um, I don't know, there is, th- those are the issues that this life is all about, right? That's, that's just what exists. Just 
being able to step back and talk about what existence is about is it's a weird thing, man. But when you do it, when you do it in a way that's satisfying, I, I think I'm existentially better off for having had those discussions, which is a weird thing to say, but yeah. Uh, the, there's something about Ecclesiastes in particular where you're reading the old Testament and it's just like, it's all kind of fitting one tone and this like almost, um, Buddhist mystical text is like just plopped right in the middle of <laughs> this very different tone. You know, yeah, that aspect. Like, I want to talk about it for a second because there is a feeling that you get when you're reading something, you know, 4,000 years old, 5,000 years old. And here, here's a little background. Like in the behavioral sciences, there's always been the a pendulum swinging back and forth about the, the question of whether human beings are more similar to each other or are more different from, from, uh, from each other. So there are anthropological traditions that say it's a mistake to think that there's anything that we have in common with somebody who was raised in a different time and a different culture. These people are completely different uh, from us. It would be, it's, a, it's arrogance to say that they... Um, that, that we could understand what they're thinking or what they're feeling or what their experience was like. And then there is the view that, look, no, we're all fundamentally made of the same stuff. We, what people might call nativist view, which is that like we come into this world with such similar uh, biology and probably some innate ideas that help us navigate the world. Um, the feeling of reading somebody 5,000 years ago and recognizing that what they're expressing is something that me, my modern ass, like here in the, in the 21st century, with all of the complications of modern life, also can resonate with, it, that they are saying things that capture my experience is damn near mystical to me because that at least settles the question in one deep way, which is, I have a lot in common with somebody who lived 5,000 years ago and who was writing, you know, on whatever parchment, um, that, yeah. that blows my mind. And it's, it's, it feels nice. And, it, you know, even when it's bitching about suffering, which Ecclesiastes and Job do, like, it still feels nice to know that they are, those people were like me. Yeah. There's this, um, golden thread that sort of is woven through the entirety of history and it's this uh sense making that we do through the aesthetic experience um and that's uh yeah that's a sort of the timeless story of man in a way yeah and that that through the aesthetic experience you know i think i've just communicated a tension between my desire to be rational and objective and my fear of intuitions and emotions as, as maybe um, m being poor guides to truth. But there is something in the truth that comes from uh, the poetic writings of, of somebody, you know, in the wisdom literature in the Bible, all the way to powerful movies that I see now or powerful works of art that really does seem to be communicating truth in a way that maybe I just can't quantify. And that is another experience that I've had doing the podcast where over time we went from talking more about science and analytic philosophy to actually tackling works of art, like, you know, short stories by Borges or by Ted Chang and uh, Dostoevsky those have become more satisfying because I think that that's just a really effective way of communicating ideas in a way that's, it's more fun. It's, it gets to the heart of the matter quicker. It's almost like a direct line into my, into my consciousness in a way that, that writing a treatise out with like, you know, step one of my proof, step two of my proof or study yeah. one, study two is, is just not the same. Yeah, you could read analytic philosophy, or you could read uh, Ursula K. L. Gwynn's. So exactly, 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 and and I think, you know, to get back to this more, I I said something to you at the beginning when we were uh, before we started recording that this that doing a podcast like Very Bad Wizards, for, which we've been doing now for eight years, has been 
um, an interesting experience because it's been centering to me. Like it's, it's allowed me to do the things that I thought academics did, <laughs> which is <laughs> be able to think broadly and deeply and have interesting conversations with people about interesting topics. When the reality is that academics uh, is in the job of narrowing your interests so, so aggressively that you actually lose the joy often of those broad topics that you went in with. And uh, being able to have a part of my life where we can cover everything from, uh, any, at least everything that interests us from, from science and analytic philosophy to, to works of science fiction is, I think, good for my mental health and for my balance as a human being. Well, you still haven't gotten on the David Lynch uh, train, it seems like. <laughs> I have very mixed feelings about that because <laughs> it's not that I don't like David Lynch, it's that sometimes I just suspect that he's putting, uh, ra he's a random number generator and that uh, <laughs> that people are interpreting whatever they want to interpret. <laughs> so, um, last question here. Um, when you look at your future professional goals, philosophical goals, um, the future of the podcast like what, what I, I just want a sneak peek of what you see all this sort of amounting to and how you're making sense of this whole thing yeah you know um i unlike a lot of my colleagues uh, who are very very sort of type a the kind of people who have an answer to the question of like where do you see yourself in 10 years i've never been that kind of a person honestly i'm enjoying the ride like I never thought we'd be doing this for eight years. There were times when I didn't want to do it um, after the first six months. But I've been extraordinarily lucky as a human being to have these opportunities uh, to do things like talk to you on a Sunday afternoon about ideas. And if there's anything that I've learned, which is very, very little <laughs> from Buddhism and people like, uh, like Sam Harris, is that living in the moment is something that is crucially important for quality of life. And, you know, I have ideas, like I have plans for things to do in the future, but I don't like living in the future. I don't like my mind spending so much time on things that I want to do that I fail to appreciate what I'm doing right now. And maybe that's mm. a cop-out answer, but that's really how I feel about it. Um, everything is it's a surprise. Maybe it's just, I have low expectations. I never thought that I would be able to do what I'm doing now. And I'm just pleasantly surprised by, by it. It's, it's fun. So there's no intention to leave Cornell and just start becoming a hip hop producer full time. Well, I'll tell you this, man. Uh, there's been a couple of times when, when I have the opportunity to actually have somebody rap over my beats, somebody, you know, who's a real rapper. And in those moments, I think to myself, fuck academics. I would <laughs> totally do that. <laughs> I would totally, just let me save up enough money from my very bad wizards, you know, mattress ads. <laughs> well, if you ever need any uh, sitar tracks you want to you wanna throw in there, let me know. So. Man, I would love that. You guys, just, <laughs> that, that, the, I don't even understand the musical scales of, of Indian music, so, yeah. but I know when it sounds good. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for coming on, Dave. I really appreciate you taking the time. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. This is really fun. Thank you for listening to Mapping Minds. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can follow us on social media, leave a review, or just share with a friend. <laughs>